One of the most secretive military campaigns in U.S. history is under the microscope like never before. In a major expose based on leaked government documents, The Intercept has published the most in-depth look at the U.S. drone assassination program to date. The drone papers expose the inner workings of how the drone war is waged, from how targets are identified to who decides to kill. They reveal a number of flaws, including that strikes have resulted in large part from electronic communications data or signals intelligence that officials acknowledge is unreliable. The documents also undermine government claims that the drone strikes have been precise. During one five-month period of an operation in Afghanistan, nine out of ten casualties were not the intended target. And among other revelations, the documents also corroborate previous reports that all foreign males in a target zone have been treated as militants unless they are proven innocent after death. The documents were leaked to The Intercept by an unnamed U.S. intelligence source who says he wanted to alert Americans to wrongdoing. With obvious comparisons to NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden, Snowden himself weighed in, tweeting, quote, "...when we look back on today, we'll find the most important national security story of the year." In a statement, Amnesty International said the leak should spark an independent congressional inquiry over, quote, "...whether the USA has systematically violated international law, including by classifying unidentified people as combatants to justify their killings." The leaks include detailed files on the drone war in Afghanistan, just as President Obama has announced his plan to again delay the withdrawal of U.S. troops and extend the occupation of Afghanistan indefinitely. For more, we begin with Jeremy Scahill, co-founder of The Intercept, one of the lead reporters on the new Drone Papers series. His contributions to the series include the articles The Assassination Complex and Find, Fix, Finish. His latest book, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield, is out in paperback. His Oscar-nominated film, Dirty Wars, um, it was done with Rick Rowley. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army. Uh, in our next segment, we'll be joined by Jeremy's co-authors on the series, Ryan Devereaux and Cora Courier. Jeremy, welcome back to Democracy Now! Astounding Thanks. revelations. Why don't you first summarize uh, what you have learned? Well, you know, the first drone strike outside of a declared war zone um, happened in November of 2002 in Yemen. Um, and in that strike, uh, it was a CIA operation um, with the military, and uh, and the whole thing was coordinated out of the uh, of a con command center in Washington D.C. And in that strike, actually, six people were killed, including an American citizen. Um, and at the time, Condoleezza Rice, you know, senior official in the Bush administration, was defending uh, the right of the president of the United States to assassinate um, individuals, including U.S. citizens, uh, based on uh, intelligence that they never had to make public. Uh, there wasn't another drone strike in Yemen uh, until uh, 2011, 2011, 2012. The Obama administration uh, really starts to intensify drone operations in Yemen. Uh, Despite the fact that, at times, Pakistan was being bombed uh, once every three days by drones, you had an active drone program in Afghanistan, uh, it wasn't until May of 2013 that a sitting U.S. president gave an official address where he acknowledged that, you know, drones were uh, being used by the United States. I mean, it was sort of a farcical, uh, you know, scenario where you'd have the president making jokes about killing the Jonas Brothers uh, at the White House Correspondents Association dinner. He would talk about it on a, a YouTube or on a Google Hangout uh, in response to questions from people talking to the president. But they never really fully own this thing in, in public. Um, what we've published uh, is an extensive. Uh, look into how this program has operated historically, but specifically under President Obama. One of the most significant uh, uh, findings of this, and my colleague Cora Courier really dug deep into this, um, is we published for the first time the kill chain, what the bureaucracy of assassination looks like. And what you see is that um, all of these officials, including people like the Treasury Secretary, are part of uh, signing off on all of this, uh, at where they have these secret meetings. Uh, and they discuss who's going to live and die around the world. And at the end of that process, it is the president of the United States who signs what, what amounts to a uh, death warrant uh, for whoever they've decided should die based on what amounts to a parallel secret 
uh, judicial system in the United States that is not really subjected to any kind of judicial review, where the president acts sort of as emperor, issues an edict that you die. And what we show, and, and this is the first time that, that there's documentary evidence of this, is that the president gives the military a 60-day window to hunt down and kill these individuals. Uh, Ken Roth from Human Rights Watch uh, pointed out today, if the standard is that the people who are uh, being targeted uh, for assassination uh, is that they represent an imminent threat, which is what the president says the U.S. policy is, uh, then why do they have 60 days to do it? Why don't they need to do it now if it's imminent? Well, that's because they've redefined the term imminent uh, to, to, to be so vague as to not even resemble its actual commonly understood definition. And, Jeremy, well, one of the things that struck me is uh, you're finding that so much of the information upon which they base uh, th these attacks uh, is based on signals intelligence, not real live intelligence or, or stuff that they've gleaned from other people they've interrogated, and the unreliability of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, the—and the, this, you know, really, we know so much more about this because of the Edward Snowden leaks. But so much of, of the entire intelligence industrial complex uh, in the, you know, sort of in the U.S. empire is de dependent upon uh, intercepting people's emails, their text messages, uh, their phone calls. Uh, and, and, you know, signals intelligence can be reliable. I mean, if, if I'm talking to you, Juan, they, you know, they, they can do our voice recognition. They can say, okay, we know that Jeremy Scahill is talking to Juan Gonzalez. Um, but uh, when you're when you uh, talk to people who really worked in that world, Cora Courier and I interviewed Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, who was the former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, you know, the top official running all of the you know Pentagon spy operations around the world, and he was Stanley McChrystal's top intelligence guy at JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, when Cora and I spoke to him, uh, he said, "Look, I can um, I can record my voice on a, on a phone." And uh, give it to a courier. The courier can go somewhere else. They, you know, they can call a number and they can play that. And someone's going to die over there, and they'll think that they've eliminated this target, uh, but they didn't. Uh, and and so, you know, it's. And he said, you know, signals intelligence is very easy to fool. I want to go back to a quote from the article, speaking about the issue of working with bad intelligence. Your source said, quote, it requires an enormous amount of faith in the technology you're using. These countless instances where I've come across intelligence that was faulty. It's stunning the number of instances when selectors are misattributed to certain people, and it isn't until several months or years later that you all of a sudden realize the entire time you thought you were going after this really hot target, you wind up realizing it was his mother's phone the whole time. Right. And, you know, what, 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 he's, what the source is talking about there is that, um, for the most part, the assassination program is not uh, targeting people. It's targeting their selectors, their cell phone uh, number, the, uh, the the SIM card data that they have, um, a, you know, an email train that's that's littered with metadata that they've now determined is connected to someone. Um, and so I think a lot of the the biggest uh, civilian death uh, cases that we have um, are because they've hit a phone that they think is in possession of, uh, you know, a terrorist or a militant, you know, the vague term that they use, uh, and. Oops, you know, well, we blew up the phone, but, you know, that person didn't happen to be there because this sub commander of the Taliban happened to throw his SIM card into a bag with everybody else's. They shake it up, and, you know, and this is a tactic that the Taliban use, and then they all go somewhere else. They use it because they know that this is how the U.S., you know, hunts them down and tracks. It's death by metadata, basically. And, and even in Afghanistan, where the United States has been occupying uh, the country and has troop boots on the ground in Afghanistan, we're not talking now Yemen, Somalia, right. or some of these other places, uh, your information found that as many as 90 percent of the intended targets were, uh, were, were not, were, of the people killed were not the intended targets? Yeah. I mean, I think the piece that if, you know, if people, you know, are, are sort of thinking about what the president said yesterday and sort of, you know, further extending the, uh, you know, the longest war in American history to a point where we don't actually see an, any end in sight. Um, you know, Ryan Devereaux's piece on manhunting in the Hindu Kush is uh, incredible. It looks at a, uh, a JSOC campaign called Operation Haymaker, uh, and, and one of the sort of among many sort of amazing revelations in it is that, you know, JSOC's claim, JSOC claims to be, like, meticulously surgically hunting down and killing leaders of al-Qaeda, leaders of the Taliban. Uh, and in one five-month period in Afghanistan, where they have all the resources, they have the, the, the uh, surveillance technology, they have informants on the ground, they have uh, ability to do night raids, to do after-action investigations, that 88 percent 
of the people that they killed in mostly drone strikes, but some other strikes as well, uh, were not the intended target of the strikes. Now, what does that mean? It could mean that they killed the Taliban subcommander uh, and uh, and a bunch of other Taliban people, and so they say, well, okay, we were targeting this one guy, but these people also were bad. Um, but it could also be that they, uh, you know, were targeting someone uh, because he had so-called Arab features, and we see that they describe they, in the documents they describe Arab features that they're taller than everyone else. Um, you know, Sean Naylor, who's a great, uh, you know, journal, uh, investigative journalist with deep ties in the military, in his new book that he, he wrote, he details this story of how uh, they they struck a target uh, because he was taller than the other people around them, and they thought that he that that meant that he was sort of an Arab or a foreign fighter, and it turned out that he was of average size, and that the people around him were children. Finally, before we go and they to killed break, them all, with the exception of I think one one survivor. Before we go to break, your source. This second Edward Snowden, who is this person? Um, well, do you want to give me your pin to your ATM card? Um, I mean, we're you know, look, this is a very brave whistleblower, and um, this administration has been uh, relentless in its war against whistleblowers. And you know, I mean, Chelsea Manning is rotting right now in a prison cell for exposing U.S. war crimes. Edward Snowden is in exile. Uh, Thomas Drake and Bill Binney, you know, had, were smeared in public and had their reputations ruined. Jeffrey Sterling is in prison right now. Uh, you know, this our source is an incredibly principled, brave individual, and um, you know, I, I I worry because the government is uh, this government has been relentless in its pursuit of people of conscience who blow the whistle and has characterized them as traitors and spies, and in the process has criminalized the ability to do independent journalism that is meant to hold them accountable, the government accountable, without fear that your sources, or in some cases the journalists themselves, are going to be put in the crosshairs of the so-called justice system. Well, your source for the article, The Whistleblower, uh, spoke out against the drone program, saying, quote, this outrageous explosion of watch listing, of monitoring people and racking and stacking them on lists, assigning them numbers, assigning them baseball cards assigning them death sentences without notice on a worldwide battlefield, it was the very first instance wrong. We're allowing this to happen, and by we, I mean every American citizen who has access to this information now but continues to do nothing about it. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the point, too, is, like, where is Congress in all of this? Where are the—you know, if this is the most transparent administration in history, especially coming off of the abuses and the torture and everything that marked the Bush administration, I mean, wouldn't the most transparent administration in history actually be a whistleblowing administration? I mean, wouldn't they sort of say, hey, all of this is really messed up. It's against what we claim are our core values. Instead, we see it's like Edward Snowden, an analyst, Chelsea Manning, a, a, you know, a private. I mean, when, when are we going to have anyone of significant public importance and, 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 and it's visible that actually is going to be about the business of transparency? You know, why, why does it have to come from whistleblowers? You also quote uh, some other former military people who talk about the, uh, their criticism of why the Obama administration has chosen right. this route. Well, I mean, we, t we spoke to, you know, Cora and I spoke to, to Mike Flynn, you know, who is, is, is no one's liberal. I mean, he is, he's one of the most significant figures in the kind of expansion of covert operations around the world. Uh, and, you know, he has his own view. I mean, they, these guys are agitated. There's a very powerful clique of people within the national security state that are advocating to a return to extraordinary rendition. Uh, enhanced interrogation techniques, um, you know, snatching people. And, and their criticism of Obama is, this guy doesn't want to stick these people in Guantanamo, so he just kills them. He doesn't even think about capturing them. And when he does that, we can't interrogate them, and that makes us less safe. So that's their tactical argument. Um, but there's, it's also part—we can talk about this later—part of a turf war between the CIA um, and the Pentagon. We're talking to Jeremy Scahill, co-founder of The Intercept, co-author of the Drone Papers series, the articles about them. His contributions to the series include the articles The Assassination Complex and Find, Fix, Finish.